it's not necessarily uh, intuitively obvious why we're talking about global public health and particularly about AIDS within the context of crimes against humanity. Perhaps it is. And so I understand that the jurists would like evidence about the scope, uh, the magnitude of the harms that are being done through the Bush administration policies involving global AIDS, that information that would let you decide whether or not those harms are predictable, foreseeable, and whether they can be directly connected to those policies. In going to Africa, which is where the global AIDS epidemic is concentrated but not limited, um, for years, despite seeing hundreds and hundreds of people dying in their homes or in clinics or in hospitals, it was very hard for me to say that this is a catastrophe. Not there will be a catastrophe, this is a catastrophe. And that may not be apparent to those of us in the United States, but for people in many countries around Africa, the impact of AIDS is overwhelming. There have been, since, it's actually almost exactly the 25th anniversary since AIDS was first recognized in Los Angeles in 1981. Uh, since that time, uh, more than 20 million people uh, have, had, have died as a result of AIDS. Uh, there are currently believed to be about 41 million people infected and alive at this point with HIV. Over 3 million people died last year of AIDS. That means that every day, 9,000 people die of AIDS. Most of those deaths are preventable, are treatable, can at least be postponed, if not cured. 2,000 of those people every day are children under the age of 15. Young people ages 15 to 24 account for half of all the new cases of HIV worldwide. Every minute, five young people worldwide becomes infected with HIV. While some communities have met this international crisis with honest education and the communication necessary to prevent the spread of HIV, in most places, sexual and reproductive health and rights, especially of young people, remain taboo, neglected, and inadequately addressed, even though, as we've heard, it is our silence that will kill us. Count one. The Bush administration is promoting deadly, abstinence-only HIV programs instead of proven medical science. The Bush administration has created policy and supported programming that officially maintains this silence, censoring critical health information. In contradiction with internationally recognized public health standards and in violation of international human rights norms, the Bush administration has made abstinence promotion programming the centerpiece of its HIV prevention efforts. So I'm here to explain the problem with abstinence-only programming and to discuss the exportation of abstinence-only programs through the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, also known as PEPFAR. Prior to PEPFAR, there actually was programming uh, money available for comprehensive HIV programming. It was through CDC, for young people, it was through CDC and it was called the Youth Life Initiative. And we advocates received about a million dollars in CDC funding to implement HIV prevention programs for young people in South Africa, Botswana, and Nigeria. When PEPFAR came along, we were told that unless we changed our programming to abstinence only until marriage, that we would lose that funding. We, of course, refused to change that change to abstinence only because we believe that comprehensive programs are what works best for reducing infection in young people, and we subsequently lost $800,000 in U.S. government funding. And then I think we have to understand that the governments, particularly the U.S. government as the most powerful government in the world, and the international organizations that they control, uh, particularly the ones like the IMF, World Bank, and World Trade Organization, um, are responsible for this shape of the global AIDS epidemic and crisis. These policies not only determine which parts of the global population are most vulnerable to getting HIV, 
but also who is most likely to have the knowledge and access to the resources for effective prevention of HIV and also for treatment of HIV. Overwhelmingly, it is the poor, the marginalized, the people of color in the United States and around the world who are getting AIDS. Within that, increasingly, it is young women. The fact that there's a global AIDS crisis that literally kills millions every year, that this crisis, uh, and for those of you who've had a chance to visit Sub-Saharan Africa, what's apparent, not just in the numbers, but in the day on, on the ground reality, is that whatever gains have been made since the decolonization of most of those countries are being rapidly reversed at this point. So, for instance, you have a country, a little country like Botswana, which actually is wealthier than most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, which had uh, an average life expectancy of 67 years, less than 10 years ago. The average life expectancy in Botswana now is 42 years. The fact is that the ideological agenda that we see manifest in the abstinence only until marriage programming is a threat not only in terms of AIDS, but in terms of the whole of young people's sexual and reproductive health. Young people do not fight HIV AIDS in a vacuum. Their efforts to remain HIV free are part of their overall effort, efforts to remain sexually healthy. I just wanna give one quick example because I know Nana's gonna talk quite a bit more about young people's sexual health overall. But for example, women in some of these countries are 30 times more likely to die from reproductive health related causes than women in industrialized countries. The Bush administration has missed a major opportunity to invest in education that supports young people's sexual health as a whole. This isn't just about HIV AIDS prevention, it's about promoting their well-being. Count two. The Bush administration has distorted sound science to suppress medical research on HIV prevention. His ideologically, his, his Christian fundamentalist agenda um, and the fact that many of my colleagues in Africa greatly resent what they call the remissionization of Africa. Every flight to Africa now that I take to Southern Africa is, it has many, many seats taken up by US missionaries of different persuasions. And I wanna be fair, some faith-based organizations in Africa have done magnificent work around the issue of healthcare, and they continue to do that. And, and I wanna be clear about that. But that, I don't think, is the driving force of why the Bush administ administration disproportionately funds faith-based organizations in Africa. You may have heard that what the core of that agenda is to say that people should be abstinent until marriage. After marriage, they should be faithful to their partners. And that condoms should be reserved for prostitutes. Um, now, this, and, and they impose this on other countries through the incredible power that they have and wealth that they supply. Um, this is particularly dangerous, obviously, for women in many places who may have little or no control over their own bodies and reproductive lives. Um, and where marriage, in fact, is one of, in many countries in Africa, marriage is one of the greatest risk factors for a HIV acquisition. As I think many of us know, faith-based organizations are a major focus for the Bush administration. And these FBOs do not represent a wide range of faith perspectives, but a disproportionate number of the radical right evangelical Christian base that also make up the president's political base, who may be as an intent on proselytizing as on preventing HIV. For example, Samaritan's Purse, run by Franklin Graham, the son of evangelist, evangelist Billy Graham, describes itself as, quote, a non-denominational evangelical Christian organization providing spiritual and physical aid to hurting people around the world. It carries this mission into its HIV prevention work by offering, quote, Bible-based education. And federally funded abstinence-only education programs um, provide uh, censor life-saving information about uh, preventing HIV, other sexually transmitted infections, and unintended pregnancies. 
these abstinence-only education programs also provide misleading or incomplete advice about contraception. And we've heard about misinformation and disinformation and about censorship and uh, gag rules and plausible deniability and really every imaginable form of deceit. Uh, so, yeah, so I think uh, one, one unifying theme of the issues, the, the apparently disparate issues raised before this commission are attacks on the truth. Count three, the Bush administration has severely restricted the global manufacture of generic HIV drugs for people most in need. The USAID has a Buy America policy. That means that money that should be going for care and treatment of people in Africa, in fact, has to go to buy expensive US drugs, that it, it has over, that it's purchases overpriced American commodities, that it uses American uh, consultants who have to fly on American airlines. In fact, in today's New York Times, you may have noticed, there was a little story that said that some people in Congress were upset because $90 million last year was budgeted to fight malaria, and it turned out that only two to three million dollars of it had ever reached the ground in Africa. The other $87 million uh, was spent in Washington on meetings and with hiring consultants. And so that's what it means that we spend the money, but where does it really go? Um, I think the fact that by insisting that PEPFAR money be spent on branded drugs when generics um, that are easier to take and just as effective can be purchased at a fraction of the price, that, that in fact it is totally predictable that this results in additional and unnecessary deaths of literally hundreds of thousands of people every year. The Bush administration signs documents at the UN that set time-limited goals about how we're going to reverse the course of the AIDS epidemic. It sets goals for preventing maternal to child transmission. It sets goals for reducing the number of orphans in Africa. It sets goals for how many people are supposed to be treated. None of the goals have even close to being met. And I would posit that, in fact, the Bush administration, because of its political and religious agenda, which is clearly political, has in fact systematically undermined those goals and is aware of the fact that they do so. And why do I say that? One, let's look at some of the people that they appoint to administer these programs. Um, a very little piece of news that happened over the past 10 days that you may have seen is that the director of um, USAID, uh, the agency uh, famous for many of us because in the 1960s they, ran the, they helped run the Phoenix program, the counterinsurgency program in Vietnam. But among its other things, is it, 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 it channels much of the money for our global AIDS effort as well as international development, since it stands for international development. When the Bush administration came to power, uh, they appointed, Ant well, they, they nominated Andrew Nastios. He was approved by Congress. But when he appeared before the Senate, their uh, activists uh, in the US and, and around the world had already been raising the issue and agitating for expanded treatment access. And so some senator um, asked uh, Director Ignacios, what did he think about the feasibility and importance of expanding treatment access in the heavily impacted countries of Sub-Saharan Africa? And his response was that he didn't think it was feasible because Africans can't tell time and you have to be able to take your pills on time. As I'll talk about briefly, the pharmaceutical companies um, have largely tried to call the shots around the issues of U.S. policy around patent rights for pharmaceuticals and whether or not cheaper, effective generic drugs were going to be available in poor and developing countries. Um, in fact, I, I think it's important to note the incredible impact that the big pharma has around policy in the United States. I mean, again, that didn't start with the Bush administration. Um, certainly in the Clinton administration, um, Al Gore's chief of staff had been head of the chief lobbyist uh, for Big Pharma. 
in fact. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, which until very recently was the most profitable sector of the economy in the United States, has fought tooth and nail that even though prior to the last few years they were selling no effective anti-AIDS treatment drugs in sub-Saharan Africa, they used their influence on the U.S. government to make sure that the U.S. government threatened or brought economic sanctions to any country that tried to develop its own generic drug industry so that it could treat its people. In summary, for the jurists, I believe that the scope of the harms being done by these policies is enormous, that the detrimental impact of these policies is entirely predictable, and in part, it's known to the Bush administration because there's been active opposition to those policies, both in the United States and in affected countries. And while some of those economic policies precede the Bush administration, the implementation in the face of the rapidly deteriorating conditions in much of Africa has gained new significance. Count four. The Bush administration enforces an international gag rule to prevent family planning and abortion services. So what exactly is the global gag rule? Basically, the gag rule denies foreign organizations receiving U.S. family planning assistance the right to use their own non-U.S. funds to provide legal abortion, counsel or referral for abortion, or lobby for the legalization of abortion in their own countries. Essentially, these NGOs must withhold information to women about the option of legal abortion and where to obtain safe abortion services using their own non-U.S. government funds. Why is family planning so important? Because every minute a woman dies in pregnancy or childbirth. By preventing high-risk pregnancies, family planning could save at least 25% of these women's lives. The global gag rule stifles free speech and prevents medical professionals around the world from offering the full range of legal, medically acceptable options to their clients. It would be unconstitutional to condition the eligibility of a U.S.-based organization for federal funds on a requirement that the organization surrender its right to free speech or participate in the political process. In other words, the gag rule would simply be unconstitutional in the U.S. To impose this requirement on non-U.S. NGOs overseas raises serious questions about the sincerity of the U.S. government's commitment to fostering democracy abroad. For foreign organizations that refuse to comply with the gag rule, the price is not just monetary. In addition to losing valuable financial resources from USAID, these organizations also lose U.S. donated contraceptives, including condoms, and valuable technical assistance two cornerstones of the USAID family planning program. A little unknown fact is that in the developing world, USAID has been the single most important donor. It is the largest procurer of condoms worldwide and delivers more than one third of all donated contraceptives and condoms. No other bilateral donor has the capacity or the expertise to fill the void left by the withdrawal of US assistance in this area. The global gag rule has had a disastrous effect on, pub on public health. It has exacerbated and intensified a condom shortage across the developing world and decreased the effectiveness of HIV prevention program programs. Shortly after the reinstatement of the global gag rule, shipments of U.S. donated condoms and contraception completely ceased to 16 developing countries, mostly in Africa. Organizations that reject the gag rule have been forced to close clinics, cut services, and increase client fees. They have been unable to obtain donated condoms and contraceptives to make up for the ones that they have lost from the U.S. government. Cutbacks to family planning services leads to less contraceptive access, which could lead to an increase in unsafe abortion, particularly in countries where abortion is not legal. Family planning providers are crucial to HIV AIDS prevention programs. They work on the front line serving the two populations at greatest risks of STIs and HIV, young women, women, and youth. The two most important agreements on women's rights were reached in 1994 at the International Conference on Population and Development, ICPD, and the Beijing Women's Conference in 1995. These landmark declarations were agreed upon by more than 175 countries and established what we call a rights-based approach to sexual and reproductive health. 
In the past five years, the Bush administration has tried everything within its power to damage these agreements at countless international settings. In March 2005, 130 governments convened for the 10th anniversary of Beijing to review progress towards women's health and rights. The U.S. delegation spent a full week focused on an anti-abortion amendment to the one-page reaffirmation of Beijing. While Egypt and Qatar initially joined the U.S. in support, even they decided to vote against it in favor of a stronger resolution. The U.S. was ultimately joined only by the Vatican and had no choice but to withdraw their amendment. I've discussed the gag rule, attacks on human rights at the UN, and the restructuring of foreign assistance. Through these distinct three distinct areas, there's a common theme of the Bush administration attacking science and human rights. The ideological assault on public health in a time when a continent is being ravaged by AIDS, maternal mortality, and disease raises serious question to the administration's claims that they are truly committed to fighting AIDS. No amount of money can make a difference in this pandemic if it is restricted by bad policy. What is the Bush administration's true agenda? Do policies that restrict access to life-saving tools to protect oneself and spread medically inaccurate information count as a crime? Last year, five million people were infected with HIV. The Bush administration is complicit in putting millions of people around the world at risk for HIV by denying them the means to protect themselves. This is a crime against humanity, and this administration must be indicted as such.